Welcome to Abundant Blessing Church, a house of prayer for all nations, where God is magnified and the people of God are edified. This is upon you inviting you to our services. Come and see and taste that the Lord is good. The Bible says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. I want to encourage you to come and fellowship with us and you'll be richly blessed in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus. Have your way, O oh Lord Jesus. Have your way, Lord Father. Have your way, Holy Spirit. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the living Jesus. Praise the King of glory. Hallelujah. Amen. Our text today is taken from the book of Mark, Mark chapter 5, verse 21 to 24, and verse 35 to 43. Mark, 21, Mark chapter 5, verse 21. It says, Now, when Jesus had crossed over again by boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered to him, and he was by the sea. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet and begged him earnestly, saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, that she may be healed, and, shall, and she will live. 24. So Jesus went with him, and a great multitude followed him and thronged him. Let's jump to verse 35. While he was still speaking, some came from the ruler of the synagogue's house, who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not be afraid. Believe. But he had no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, and the brother of James. Then he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and saw a tumult, and those who wept and wailed loudly. Then he came in. When he came in, he said to them, Why make this commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they ridiculed him. But when he had put them all as outside, he took the father and the mother of the child, and those who were with him, and entered where the child was lying. And he took the child by the hand and said to her, Talika Takumi, which is translated, Little girl, I say to you, arise. Immediately. The girl arose and walked for, for she was 12 years of age. And they were overcome with great amazement. But he commanded them strictly that no one should know it and said that something should be given to given her to eat. May the Lord bless and implant his word in our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. The topic of this morning's sermon is God has the final say. God has the final say. My question this morning to you is this. Who has the final say in your life? Is this your situation? Is it your circumstance? Is it your business? Is it your marriage? Is it your spouse? Is it, the, is it the, um, your relationship? Who has the final say? 
Is it the leaders who has the final say? Is it your health who has the final say? The definition of final is the deciding and determining factor in a situation. It is the deciding or the determinating factor in a situation or circumstance or an issue. Or we might say it's the end result of a thing. That means final. When we say God, when we say God has the final say, we are saying to we are saying to God that whatever you have said or whatever you are saying is the final, is the conclusion, is the conclusion of the matter, is the end result of the matter, and is the last say. When we say God has the final say, we are saying we do not want to know what other saying is going around. But what God has the final say. Because his word is forever. The final say is the word of God. It is what God says that is final. And because the word of God is non is unwavering, the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. The word of God is forever. The word of God is non-negotiable. It is unchangeable. The word of God is irrevocable. It's unchallengeable. It stands forever. It's binding. The word of God is our life. The word of God is what God desires in our life. The word of God cannot be adjusted to fit into our lives. The word of God makes us to be adjusted to what it says. Hallelujah. The word of God cannot be altered or removed. You cannot add to it. You cannot take away from it. It stands forever. Because heaven and earth will pass away, but his word will remain. The word of God, at the end of the word, is not a comma. It's a period. Because it's the end result. And it's the final say. I want to tell you this morning that those things that do not have final say in our life is whatever the doctor says about our situation. It's not final. Whatever the mortgage company has told us, which is negative, it's not final. Whatever the banks have said, it's not final. Whatever the colleagues have said, it's not final. Whatever your boss has said, it's not final. Whatever the Senate has said, it's not final. Whatever the employers have said, it's not final. Whatever the admission officer says, it's not final. Because the only one that has the final say is our Lord Jehovah. Praise the Lord. Because whatever we are going through right now, whatever situation is going through us, I want us to know that it is just temporary. It's just for a moment. It's just for a while. Because the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, is still in it with you. And he's the one who's going to bring it to a conclusion. So let's trust him. Because anything that we're going through is not the final thing. It's not the final say. Because we know that things like that don't last forever. But God lasts forever in our lives in Jesus' name. Because when we are going through things in our lives, when we are going through situations in our lives, let's not give up on God. Let's hold on to him because he will always show up at that time, at the right time and the right place. He's always there with us. He will show, us on he will show up on time because he's never late. He's never early. He's right on target, right on time. So let's not, let, let's not throw in a towel. Let's just depend on him. Because it's not over, except God says it's over. It's not final, except God says it's final. And it's not ended, except God says it's ended. Hallelujah. It's to humble ourselves. The Bible says, humble yourselves before God. And in due season, he will elevate us. He will exalt you. When you see Mark 5.22... And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus by name. And he went, and when he saw him, he 
he fell at his feet. Jairus had a sick, has a sick doctor at home, almost to the point of death. But when we look at Jairus, he was a ruler of the slum. He was one of those who arranged and supervised the orderliness of service in the synagogue. The synagogue is like the church. It's a place of worship where the Jews worship God. And so he was, he was of high position. He was a respectable person. He was very important in the community. He had everything. And, so, and one thing about the synagogue, the Jews there could not. They did not have a good relationship with Jesus. They did not have a good relationship with the Lord Jesus. And now he is a ruler of the synagogue. He is a Jew. What did he do? He humbled himself and went to Jesus. He humbled himself. It is humility that brought him to the Lord Jesus. He would have been so proud and very egoism and egoistic and do what? And say, no, I can't go there. But because of the life of his daughter, he humbled himself. He, was, he took the risk of coming to Jesus because he would have been he would have been taken out of the synagogue. He would have lost his position. He would have lost his position in the synagogue, in the society, by going to Jesus. Jesus that they had, had, was not popular among the Jews in the synagogue. He would have lost everything. But he was desperate for help. Are we desperate for help from God? For us to give up everything? He set aside his pride. He set aside his po profession. He set aside his position. He set aside his achievements. He set aside his friends, his ambition, his fame. He set aside his name to come to Jesus. He humbled himself. Are we desperate enough for Jesus? For us to go to Jesus? Or are we still holding to what God himself has given to us? Are we still holding on time, treasure, money? Let's examine ourselves. Let's humble ourselves. He had a selfless attitude. He didn't go to Jesus because of himself. He went there because of his daughter. He had a father heart, a heart of a true father. He didn't send his wife. He didn't say the bad one is the wife's son and the, the good one is his. He stood up as a father and went to look for a solution for his daughter. Selfless attitude towards, what, towards his daughter. And he came to Jesus. He respected Jesus. He came with an expectation a great expectation to receive. If we want God to have his perfect way and final say in our lives, we need to come to Jesus in expectation to touch that situation. No other person could help Jarius. He came to Jesus. He did not put any other person to go for him. He went himself. He wasn't waiting for the pastor to pray. He wasn't waiting for the friends to gather money together. He went directly to Jesus. The Bible says, call upon me. He says, call upon me, and I will answer you. The Bible says that when he saw him, Jarius saw Jesus, meaning he was seeking Jesus. And that's what we need to do. Seek the face of the Lord. Hallelujah. He sunk his him and he fell at his feet. He was seeking Lord Jesus. He didn't know who Jesus really was. But he had heard about Jesus. And he came to Jesus. He saw Jesus 
going and helping him in that situation? How do you see Jesus in any situation you are going through? We need to start seeing the Lord and this, with his eyes of faith. Believe in God that in any situation, we keep on seeing Jesus. He's the one who is going to create the laughter. Just keep on seeing Jesus with the eyes of faith, believing him. The Bible says he fell at his feet. A sign of worship, a sign of humility, and a sign of respect. Do we worship the Lord enough? He says, they that worship the Lord, worship him in spirit and in truth. He humbled himself, bowed at the feet of Jesus. An act of respect. One thing about Jairus was he was not a born-again Christian. But he fell on his feet and worshipped. He worshipped him like God, the Lord Jesus to notice him because he was worshipping him with his heart, God. When things, things are about, they're so hard, we need to praise God in every situation because it brings and evokes the presence of God and changes that situation around. It might be hard to praise when you're going through a hard time, but just do it. The Spirit of God will give you the power. It will empower you. Because I know one thing is that when you start praising and worshiping God, the devil gets uncomfortable. The devil starts shivering where he is. Why is he getting uncomfortable? Why is he getting all upset when you're praising? Because he knows that the king of kings is coming down into that situation. He knows that the Lord of lords is coming to your rescue at that situation. So he has to take his load and get out. Hallelujah. So all those negative words, all those negative things that you're thinking, when you start praising God, it starts finding itself out of your system because the atmosphere is changing. Your life is start changing because things are happening when you praise the Lord, when you worship him. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. And so praise and worship. So if you want God to have the final say in your life, you need to humble yourself and bow before the Lord, and he will come in Jesus' name. The second thing is to ask the Lord. Jarius asked the Lord. He pleaded to the Lord. When you see Mark 5, 23, it says, and begged him. Jarius begged him. Begged Jesus earnestly and gave the request about his daughter. He says that you may lay your hands on her, that she be healed, and she will live. His asking was not beating around the bush. Oh, Lord, you know. You know how many things I'm doing for you. Oh, Lord, you know what I'm doing, what's going on right now. Uh -uh. God is saying, tell me exactly what you want. Ask me. That's what God is saying. He's not saying, stop beating around the bush. He already knows anyway before you start talking. He needs you to just be direct. This is what he wants. It's my daughter. I need her healed. Fine. That's, that's your request. In faith, he pleaded. He was interceding. And he had an expectation that God was going to answer him. It was a prayer request. Children of God, we need to come. The Bible says, call to God. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. He's our father. He created us. We need to be comfortable in God. There's no tiny thing that might be going on in our lives. Let's give it to God. He says, cast all your cares upon me for I care for you. God wants us to come to him. This man had no relationship with Jesus. But he came to Jesus Christ and asked. And faith. He was specific. Because he knew that the Bible says, and in, in Psalm 91, verse 18, he said, He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. Chapter 3, 3 says, Call to me, and I will answer you, and I will show you great and mighty things which you do not know. Isaiah 65, 
verse 24 says, It shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. Because he knows the end from the beginning. So before you call, he said, I will answer. And while you are still speaking, he says, I will hear. That is God. He just wants us to ask. Ask, and it will be given. Not only that Jairus asked, he asked because he knew who Jesus, he knew something about Jesus. He has seen the works of Jesus. He saw him heal before. And so he came to ask because he knew Jesus was a healer. It is what you know about Jesus that he manifests in your life. If you know Jesus as your healer, he will heal you. If you know Jesus as your supplier, he will provide for you. If you know Jesus as the burden carrier, he will carry your burden. You know him as your protector, he will protect you and your household. You know him as the defender, he will fight your battle for you. What do you know about Jesus in your life? What you know about him is what is going to be manifested in your life. How do you know him? Through the word of God. That's how you know him. And Jairus also asked. He asked with faith. And why do I say he asked with faith? Because the Bible didn't say he asked with faith. But from what he said, you will know he asked by faith. Because he says that she may be healed and she will live. Meaning he already spoke what he wanted the request to the answer to the request. He already said what it was, that she will live. That's what faith is about. Lord, help me, help me. Why are you saying help me alone? Why don't you tell him what you want him to help you for and the end result of what you want from God? He already spoke the end re result because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. He already spoke because faith is the substance of the thing hoped for evidence of things unseen. He has not seen the healing. He has not seen the child living. He has not seen the child being healed, but he spoke it. That she will be, that she will live. He spoke the word of faith. Because, what, because faith germinates in adversity. When there is adversity, then you see faith growing. Faith springs up in the soil of trouble. That's when your faith increases. When you know that there's nothing that can help you out, but only God, you, start, you increase your faith. Believe in him, trusting him to walk his purpose. So ask him so that he will be able to have the final say in our lives. Number three, the thing that how to allow God to have the final say is to allow the Lord to walk with you. As you walk with him, you allow him to walk with you. Jairus allowed Jesus to walk with him. How? Verse 24, Mark 5, 24. He says, so Jesus went with him. He said, no, don't come with me, Lord Jesus. Just, you know, say your thing. But he allowed Jesus to walk with him. He says, so Jesus went with him and a great multitude followed him and clung to him. Jesus didn't ask Jairus questions about anything that happened. How did he fall sick? When did it happen? What's your family history? He did not ask all those questions that the doctors keep on asking us. Amen. But what did he do? He just went with him. He asked and Jesus went with him. Jesus went with him because Jairus asked him. Are you asking the presence of the Most High in your life? Are you asking God to walk with you and you with him? Are you asking him in faith? Because the Bible says that 1 John 5.14 says, 1 John chapter 5.14, it says, Now this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, 
he hears us. He hears us. So he asked him to follow him. And Jesus followed him. Jesus went with him. He asked God, Jesus to follow him in that trouble, in that problem, in that situation. And Jesus went with him. I am telling you, the Bible says that when we go through, when we pass through the waters, Isaiah 43, verse 2, when you pass through the waters, it says, I will be with you. God is saying, when you are passing through the waters of sorrow, waters of trouble, waters of tribulations, he says, I will be with you. And through the rivers, you shall not, you shall not overflow. It shall not overflow you. The rivers, the trouble will not overcome you. You will prevail over those problems. You will prevail over those troubles. He says, it shall not overflow you. He says, when you walk through the fire, the fire of persecution and tribulation, here and there, he says, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. Why? Because he is with us. Because he is holding us with his righteous right hand. He is covering us. Have the confidence of the presence of God. Amen. Number four, be patient. Because delay is not denial. Be patient and persevere. Be patient and persevere. For God, for you to allow God to have his final say in our in our every situation in our lives, we need to be patient and we need to persevere. When you look at the when um, Jesus was following Jairus to his home, he got to verse 25. When he got to verse 25 of that same Mark 5, that comes the woman with the issue of blood. Ah, Jairus was following Jesus. And here is this woman from nowhere touching the hem of the garments of Jesus Christ. Making there to be a delay. What do you think Jairus was thinking? I can think what he was thinking too. Woman, leave this man alone. Let, let, just, let him go with me to my daughter's to, to heal my daughter. He will be already frustrated and irritated by this woman. He will be saying and cutting in his heart. He will even want some people to drag the woman away from Jesus. But Jesus had time for everybody. Even when there were so many things going on, he could do things at the same time, different things at the same time. He knew what he was doing. He waited. He healed the woman with the issue of blood. But what happened? They came to tell him the, the news about his daughter. But before that, I want us to know something about delays. When there's a delay in our lives, when there's a delay on, in situations, in circumstances, in something that we are looking up to, for, up to God for, whatever it might be, it might be marital, it might be spiritual, physical, it might be emotional, it might be ma in whatever the situation we are waiting up on the Lord for, let's be patient. It's not, it's, uh, some of the, it's not something that can hold you down completely. It will come to pass whatever you are looking up unto God for. It might be, to us, it might be a delay. But God is saying, this situation or some circumstances are not to be dead. It will come to pass. But we need to go through a time of delay to build us up. Because there are two types of delays in one's life. One of them is divine. The divine delay. And the second one is a demonic delay. When we're talking about a divine delay, it is it's set up for, from God for a purpose, for a reason, to bring us to our destiny, to bring us to our dream, to our divine dream. That divine delay might be the test of our faith, might be the test of our patience, 
It might be the test of our faithfulness, a test of integrity, a test of character. But at the end result, God always takes glory for it. Because the Bible says in James 1, 3, it says, Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but let patience have his perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. He's bringing us to a perfection. He's bringing us to our destiny. That delay that you think is a delay is not a delay in the eyes of God. It's a plot, it's a plan of God to bring you to that desire of your heart. Amen. But when we are talking about the demon, demonic delay, that's a delay that is set up by the devil. That's why we need to distinguish. We need to discern what kind of delay is this. Is this demonic or is this divine by God? Because if it's a demonic delay, it's time for you to activate your weapon. Hallelujah. Because God has given us the weapon of warfare, which is not carnal, but is mighty through God in the pulling down of strongholds. So every stronghold of delays has to come down in the name of Jesus. Why? Because God has given you and equipped you for that, for you to fight against the devil. And he has always given you the victory. It's time to activate your hammer. The Bible says that it's not the word of God like hammer that breaks the rock. So every rock, every stone, every mountain that is standing to hinder you has to be broken down by the word of God, which is the hammer of God. You need to, uh, you need to activate the consuming fire of God. Because the Bible says God is a consuming fire. And so those things that do not belong, that want to hinder you or pull you down or, or take you down, you want to activate that weapon of the consuming fire of God and consume them completely in Jesus' name. And when it's time for you to speak to the mountain, the Bible says, speak to the mountain. Hallelujah. Because it's going to, uh, the mountain has to move. The Bible says in Mark eleven twenty three, 23, For as surely I say to you, what, whoever says to this mountain, Mark eleven twenty three, 23, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt and in, in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done. He will have whatever he says. You will have whatever you say. So when you speak to a mountain, when you speak to a situation, it needs to listen and answer to whatever you have said by doing what you have said. Because God has given you his word. His word cannot be hindered. His word goes forth to go and go to those situations to go to that situation and that circumstance to operate in it. Because the word of God in your mouth is great. Hallelujah. Who has thou great mountain before Zerubbabel? Who has thou great mountain before you? As the Bible says, become a plain. Hallelujah. And if it's the Red Sea, they need to depart. They need to pass. If it's a wall of Jericho, they need to fall down flat. No matter what the delay might be, do not give up. Do not cave in. Allow God in that situation. Number five, get rid of the negative voice. Or quiet the negative voice. How to allow God to have the final say. Quiet that negative word. The Bible says in that same, um, in our text, Mark 5.35, while he was still speaking, while Jesus was still speaking, meaning while Jesus was still speaking to the woman with the issue of blood, while he, he was still telling the woman with the issue of blood, daughter, your, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. While he was yet speaking this word, what happened? Some came from the ruler of the synagogue house who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? Devastating reports. Breaking news. Shocking news. Faith shaking. Hope destroyed. Dreams shattered. Hopelessness. What you came to Jesus for? What's the point 
the child is dead. But who has the final say? <laughs> He's dead. You think that situation concerning your academics is dead? You think that situation about your papers in this land is dead? You think that situation about your child is dead? It's not dead. You think your finances are dead already? Or your life in general you think is dead? It's not dead. It's momentary. It's for a moment. Hallelujah. And J Jairus must have been thinking. It's over. He must be thinking. It's over. And here comes the bad news carrier. Oh, the daughter is dead. Let's see what he's going to do. He went to Jesus. Faith killers. Destiny killers. Dream killers. Negative people. Naysayers. Oh, it's done. It's finished. That's the end. Hmm. They didn't know the God we are serving. Because no one can say it's finished with you. Until God says it's finished. Hallelujah. The power of the tongue. Don't allow. Don't accept any negative word from nobody. Do not accept what is negative. What the word of God has not said about you, reject it. Because the Bible says death and life are in the power of the tongue. Proverbs 18.21. Death and life. Death and life. Death is something that is not in the word of God that is contrary to the word of God. That's the word of death. But word of life is the word of God. It's the word of encouragement. It's the word that will lead you, that is in line with your destiny. That's the word you want to hear. That's the word. He said, why trouble the, the teacher further? When the Bible says in Isaiah 62, verse 7, the Bible says, and give him no rest. It says, give God no rest. I can determine I am going to ask a request today, tomorrow, till years and years until I get it. Because the Bible says that we should pray until our joy be filled. I am praying in faith and not in doubt, but I'm still repeating what I just told him yesterday. Until I get it, until I get it. I see it with my spiritual eyes, but I want to see the manifestation. And so he says, ah, don't grapple that teacher. But the Bible says, give him no rest till he establishes, until he makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. So why are you, get, why are you, making, Jesus, why are you making God rest? Hallelujah. Why are you giving him rest? His duty is to help us. He's here for us. He's our protector, our provider, everything in us. He is. And so go and give him rest until you have gotten what you desire from him. In line with the word of God. Hallelujah. And so don't let us stop praising him. You can keep rolling on the floor. You can still, you know, screaming, shouting, praising, whatever. Just keep on. Give him no rest. Because God has the final say. But we didn't hear the Bible say, Jairus said anything. But we know that things will have been going through his heart. He's a normal human being. Amen. The Bible says in Lamentation 3.27, it says, who is he? Lamentation 3.37. Who is he who speaks? And it comes to pass when the Lord has not commanded who are you to say what God has not commanded? Who are you to prophesy a negative thing in my life when God has not commanded you? Who are you to speak what is not in line with God in our lives when God has not commanded it? Who is he? That's what the Bible says. Whose reports will you believe? Are you going to re believe the reports of the doctors or the lawyers? of the bankers, of the admission um, officers? Are you going to believe that negative report? Just as, it, as the 10 uh, spies came and reported negatively to the Israelites? Whose reports will you believe? We shall believe the report of the Lord. Because the report of the Lord says we are healed, we are restored, we are the head, we are not the tail, we are redeemed, we are his righteousness. 
We are favored and blessed. We are, we are, we are well. That's the report we believe. We are prospering. Get rid of that negative word or that negative voice in our brain, in our, in our head. Because we start thinking negatively. We start thinking thoughts that are not right. We have to start changing our thinking in line, to be in line with the thinking of God, with the word of God. Because the Bible says, as a man thinks, so is he. So when we start thinking negatively, when we start hearing the negative voice, we need to quench it with the word of God. We need to quench it right away and replace it with the word. If there is a voice saying, will you ever get better? Your voice, your reply should be, the Lord rebuke you in the name of Jesus. I, will, I am whole. I am healed by the stripes of Jesus Christ. That's what we need to say. Replace it immediately. Don't let it settle. Don't let that negative voice settle in your life. Replace it immediately with the word of God. What has the word said concerning that situation? That's what you need to speak. Hallelujah. So if you want God to have his final say, get rid and quiet those negative voices. Number six, do not be afraid. Only believe. That was the word Jesus said. Whereas the Bible says in Mark 5.36, as soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not be afraid, only believe. Do not be afraid, only believe. Do not be afraid, only believe. Why? Because he was at the trash, because he knew that the devil had started communicating. And Jesus stepped in right away, immediately. The devil was throwing the greatest, at, he was throwing the greatest weapon he had. Why? Because he knew that Jairus was at the verge, at the threshold of his breakthrough. He knew that it was only remaining a little mile for Jesus to walk to that house and lay the hands upon that child for healing. And it's like, I would throw my best weapon. And he threw his best weapon, but not knowing that Jesus is greater and higher and powerful than any weapon the devil can throw against you. And so, he, the heat, the heat of the problem was great. It's at that time when we are about to get to that breakthrough, get that employment, get that peace, get that joy, get that miracle. That's when the heat, the battle is so hard. That's when the battle is so great. Why? Because he does not want us to get what God has said. Second Chronicles 20, 20 says, Believe in the Lord, and you shall be established. Believe his prophets, and you shall prosper. Believe. Only believe. When you believe, that's when God can step into that situation. That's when God can have his final say. Because Isaiah 41 verse 10 says, Fear not, for I am with you. The reason why we should not fear, the reason why we should believe, it's because God is with us. He says, for I am with you. Be not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Just believe. The children of old, the people of old, God had to encourage them too. Abraham was told, do not be afraid, Abraham. I am your shield. And your exceeding great reward. He told Moses, do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. He told Joshua, do not be afraid, nor be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you everywhere you go. He told even Ezekiel, ah, do not be afraid of them, nor be dismayed at their looks. He said, looks, do not, even, do not be afraid of it. And he said to Jehoshaphat, do not be afraid or dismayed because the Lord God, or because of the great multitude. And God is telling us, do not be afraid. Only believe and you will see 
the salvation of the Lord in Jesus' name. And so they were going. And um, he had to, you know, take some people out. The Bible says in Mark 5, 37, going through our text, and he permitted no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. So Jesus Christ selected those who are going to go with him to Jairus' house. Check your companions. That's number seven. Check your companions. Check those who are following you, who call themselves friends. Check them out. Can two work together except they agree? Are they in unity of spirit and faith? Those were the inner caucus of Jesus. They had the same mind of Jesus. And so he picked them. We need to pick and choose our friends. Pick those who will elevate you, not those who will bring you down. Pick those that will take you to Jesus and not away from Jesus. Pick those that will keep you from falling and not those who are going to make you fall. Keep those who will uplift you and not downgrade you. Pick them by the power of the Spirit of God. When Gideon was going to, the, um, to fight the Midianites, he picked himself. 32,000 people wanted to follow him to that battle. 32,000. He was confident. Oh, I have all this army. They're going to fight against the Midianites. If we get home, we can, we can read Judges chapter 7. And when he, he was going and God said, uh-uh, no. Tell those who don't want to go to that battle, go back home. And let those who want to go follow you. Hmm? People dropped down. We had 22,000 people following, following um, Gideon. 22,000 people, okay, tell them to drink water at the well. Tell them to drink water at that river. I know those who are going to follow you, and I know those who are not going to follow you. And out of um, 22,000, 300 people were picked by God to follow Gideon to the, to the war. And they had the victory. You need to pick. You need to ask God to choose those that you want, that he wants you to be close to, your friends. Hallelujah. Who are those who are supposed to be in a caucus with you? Those with the same mind, the mind of Jesus Christ. You need to be sensitive in the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. And so, um, number eight. How to allow God to have the final say is for us to change our atmosphere. The atmosphere that Jesus went into, when he found them, they were wailing, they were crying. In, uh, if we can read Mark 5, we already read it, 5, 38 to 39, where there was so much commotion. People were weeping, crying, because the child was dead. There were hired cry um, there were hired people that cried and wept, and there were fake, there were fake people, and there were real people crying. And Jesus knew the fake, and he knew the genuine. Noise, commotion, confusion. God is not an author of confusion. The atmosphere there was a depressing atmosphere. There was the aroma of death in that atmosphere. What spirit is operating in your atmosphere? What spirit is operating in your home? Wherever you find yourself, in your jobs, in your business. What spirit do you allow to have its way there? It depends on you. It depends on what you are speaking into the atmosphere and what others are speaking into. So Jesus speak, spoke by faith. He says, the child is not dead for sleeping. That's the uh, last part of verse 39 of Mark 5. He spoke into that hopeless situation. He spoke into that depressing atmosphere. And what he spoke was the word of faith. He's not dead. She's not dead for sleeping. It negated the power of death and it changed the atmosphere 
right away. When you speak faith into that atmosphere, when you speak faith into wherever you are, that cloud of depression needs to leave because you are already speaking the word of God. There are not two atmospheres that can occur at the same time. No, one has to overrule. And it's the spirit of God that always overrules the spirit of the devil. So when you get into a, into a place, speak the word of God into that place. Release the spirit of God into it. Hallelujah. Number eight, do not be distracted. Keep your eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of the faith. When you see verse 4, 40 of that same Mark 5, they ridiculed him. They ridiculed Jesus, and they ridiculed him. But when he had put them outside, he put them outside because he, they were ridiculing him. He took the father and the mother out of the child, and those who were with him, and entered where the child was lying. They ridiculed him because of their unbelief. They mocked Jesus because they didn't know who Jesus was. Jesus had no time to debate with anybody. He just needed quietness and reverence. So he pushed them out. Do not be distracted by those things going around us. But look unto Jesus. Have you been ridiculed because of your faith? Have you been ridiculed because of your color, your gender, your age, your circumstances, what you are going through? Don't worry. You will have the last laugh in Jesus' name. You will not be disappointed. Those mockers, those, those who are ridiculing us are the ones that will be put to shame in Jesus' name. Because God is turning things around. Now, going to the last part. Mark, uh, Mark 5, 41. Then he took the child by the hand, said to her, Talita Kumi, which translated, little girl, I say to you, arise. The Bible says, immediately. Immediately. No delay. Just immediately the girl arose and walked for, for she was 12 years of age. She, the girl arose and walked. Immediately. The mockers didn't have the final say. Those who are weeping did not have the final say. The negative confession did not have the final say. The evil reports did not have the final say. But Jesus had the final say in that situation because the girl rose up because God brought forth that girl out of that death and made her alive. I am saying that anything that has brought us down, whatever it is, the Lord is chopping them off in the name of Jesus and is putting us by the hand and saying, Arise, girl. Arise, boy. Arise, brother. Arise, sister. Because he's going to do what he has planned to do. The Bible says immediately that girl arose. When God speaks into that situation, that situation has to cooperate with the word of God. Because the word of God is stronger and powerful. And so when the word of God is being expressed in any situation, it has to respect the word. Hallelujah. And so anything, the Lord God Almighty will cause us to arise in the name of Jesus. Because when he holds us by the hand, we will arise above our situation. We will arise above that pain. We will arise above that hardship. We will arise above that sickness. Why? Because the chain that is holding us down, that chain that is holding us down, that is holding that situation down, that is holding our blessings down, that is holding our breakthrough down, because of the word of God, every chain has to break in the name of Jesus. Because it says immediately, I say immediately, those chains need to be broken, that we might be set free, that we may be, ab uh, may be able to arise. The Bible says in Psalm 33 verse 9, Psalm 33 verse 9 says, For he spoke and it was done. He spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. What did he say? Arise. And what did the child do? She arose. So shall it be in our lives in Jesus' name. Anything, anything that seems dead in our lives, as Jesus says, arise, the Lord God, we arise in the name of Jesus. Because he's the king of kings. He spoke, he spoke to the storm and the storm stopped. 
He spoke to the wind, and the wind obeyed. He spoke to the girl, and the girl arose. And yet he spoke to Lazarus. Welcome to Abundant Blessing Church, a house of prayer for all nations, where God is magnified and the people of God are edified. This is upon to inviting you to our services. Come and see and taste that the Lord is good. The Bible says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. I want to encourage you to come and fellowship with us and you'll be richly blessed in Jesus' name.